I'm Dr Jenny Gray. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Zoos Victoria. I think I might have the best job in the world. Every day, people come to our zoos and fall in love with animals. They come and see our gorillas and tigers and giraffe, and they learn about these incredibly impressive creatures. But you don't always see some of the animals that we're working with. In fact, we have animals that we're keeping behind the scenes that you'd never see. And the reason you'd never see them is, first, they're critically endangered. Secondly, they're small, they're nocturnal, they don't come out during the daytime. And they probably wouldn't make the best animals for visitors to spend time with. But they are so important to us because saving them and making sure that they exist well into our future is a really important part of who we are as Zoos Victoria. So today I'm going to take you and introduce you to some of the creatures you'll never see in our zoos but some of the creatures that we've spent an enormous amount of time, effort and money making sure that they survive here in Victoria. So come with me, let me show you and introduce you to the scientists trying to save these critically endangered species. I'm joined by the wonderful Amy Kutsia. Amy is a threatened species biologist. Amy, tell everyone what does that even mean? So my job is to help eastern white bandicoot, so save them from extinction. And what is an eastern barred bandicoot? They are this amazing animal, so they weigh less than a kilo. They have this extraordinary pointy nose. They have these eyes that tend to bulge out of their heads and a little tiny white tail. And um, they can jump, even though they're, they're only 15 centimetres high, they can jump up to 1.2 metres high. And they love to dig, so that, that's, that's their thing. They, they dig in the soil and they turn over that soil and improve the soil health. So they're actually a fantastic animal to have around. So they're good for the environment, they're super cute. What happened to them? Why are we working with them? Because as people are knowing, this series we're talking about all the animals that are critically endangered and actually when it comes to really really endangered the eastern barred bandicoot was one of the priority species we took on a few years ago. Yeah I've been working with them for 16 years now so when I first started working with them there may have only been about a hundred left in Victoria. That was Okay it. let's just pause for a moment only a hundred left in Victoria when you started 16 years ago and yeah. it didn't go very well for them after that? No, well it started long before that. Um, so back in the, the 70s and the 80s the population was declining. So from the start, um, from European settlement they started to decline. So we used to find them from about Melbourne all the way to the South Australian border in an area that we call the Basalt Plains. And so they were all across that area and then with European settlement they started to change that habitat, the grassy woodlands into farmland and then foxes were introduced and that's, that's a key threat. So we know that one fox in an area of eastern wide bandicoots is just one fox too many. So the key to saving them from extinction is to take the fox out of the equation. So you've been working for the last 16 years to find, create, look after fox-free places for bandicoots to thrive. Yeah, and originally the only place we could put them where they were safe from fox predation was in fence sites. So there's four reserves across Victoria where there are now bandicoots surrounded by these predator exclusion fences. But these are, fences are really, really expensive to build, so they can cost up to $40,000 per kilometre. So that means that the size of those reserves is restricted. Now we've started to put them onto fox-free islands and we've got three islands where we've released them. So it's Churchill, Phillip Island and most recently French Island. Islands are really exciting and you're also working on another incredibly innovative project or two, I'm sure. But what's next for Eastern Barred Bandicoots? So at the moment we've done all of our translocations into all the sites that we're going to do except for one, so the Guardian Dog Project you probably know all about, so we released... Well, I might, but not everyone knows all about Guardian Dogs, so why don't we pause there and talk about 
talking another incredibly cute, fluffy, but not little, big white dog. Yes, big white dog, which, which could be a game changer for having eastern bright bandicoots back in the wild on the mainland. So this idea is built on the little penguins in Warrnambool, um, where they use Maremma guardian dogs to protect those penguins from foxes. So we've taken that idea and we thought maybe it will work with bandicoots, but we know that we can't bond these dogs to bandicoots because they're small, they're solitary, they're nocturnal, they're just not very interesting to the dogs. So instead we've bonded the dogs to sheep, which we know they bond to really well because that's been done for millennia. And because sheep and bandicoots love the same kind of habitat, the bandicoots should get that reward from um, the dogs keeping the foxes away. So hopefully they can all live together and bandicoots can, their populations can grow in the wild on the mainland. Now, I was lucky last year I managed to go out to the place that the guardian dogs have been deployed um, and you've just started releasing bandicoots there. How's that going? We Is did. it working? So we released 20 Eastern Bright Bandicoots in November last year. So they came from Captivity, Hamilton and Churchill Island and we started radio tracking them straight away so they had these little tiny trackers on their tails so we could follow them to their nest site to see if they were surviving. So, so far they seem to be really doing really well. So they've bred over summer, yeah. which is good. We, we don't always see breeding over summer. We do when it's particularly wet and when the population isn't at capacity. So it's great to see them breeding and yeah we'll monitor them again in a couple of months and, and see how they get going. So I love what Amy just talked about because for you and me we say release the bandicoots and we walk away and you then do years of work and, and get the sites ready with weed eradication, with cat suppression, with trying to make it ready and safe for the bandicoots. Yeah. Then you release them, you have to make sure they're healthy before you do that, that you've got the right animals and they're all good to go. Yeah. And then you still monitor them to make sure that they do well after the release. So an incredible amount of work it's that you do. It's a huge amount of work. Like it can take years. Like the French Island release took 12 years to get that happening. So there's a huge amount of work. And then you go out to the release and it's all over in a couple of minutes. And, and it's like, oh, okay. And they don't um, even <laughs> say thank you. They just hop off. No, they, they just run away. But then that's when you start to worry. You start to worry. It's like, oh. Yeah, is something going to go wrong? <laughs> and you have a few a sleepless behind? nights, yeah. yeah, you know, like, oh God, well, yeah, what, what could possibly go wrong? And, you know, when you start monitoring your animals or, you know, we use camera traps a lot. So when you start seeing pictures of, of females with these bulging pouches or little younger foot running behind, yeah, that's when you can start relaxing a bit and going, no, this is working, this is really good. moved this species from a hundred in Victoria when you took over how many are there out running around Victoria now oh we'd have to have around at least a thousand I'd say yeah at least a thousand yeah so now and I didn't do that alone you know that's that's working with so many people from different organizations as well as all the volunteers and everybody that comes out to do the monitoring with us so there's, there's been a huge effort from a lot of people on this project over the last 33 years of recovery. Um, but now that we've released bandicoots into all but one site, where we've got, we've got one more guardian dog site to put bandicoots in, now we, we get to monitor, this is the exciting bit, we get to monitor them and see these populations grow and hopefully, especially on the islands, the Phillip Island and French Island have thousands of hectares of suitable habitat. So hopefully over the next few years, we're going to start to see really big increases in population sizes. Well, you're getting to my last question, which is what do you dream of for the future of bandicoots? Well, I had, some, I had a seven year old um, ask me a question once and he said, once you've saved the Eastern Bied Bandicoot from extinction, what are you going to do for a job? <laughs> and I think that's what I've got to look forward to in the next few years is no longer working with the Eastern Bard Bandicoot, which is really sad but really exciting at the same time because if they don't need our help, that's, you know, we've, we've done our work, we've done a great job. That is, that's what real success looks like. Thousands of Bandicoots, you've now secured enough land that if we're right, nature will take its course and we will end up with thousands, not yeah. just 1,000, many thousand bandicoots. Amy, thank you so much for sharing time with us and more importantly, thank you for helping us to save the Eastern Bard Bandicoot. Thank you. <laughs>